this guy figured out the sun was the center of the solar system more than a thousand years before Copernicus. This guy predicted germ theory before they knew germs were a thing. And this guy invented the automobile in 1769? Is that right? Science is a slow and methodical process, but throughout history there have been visionaries that were too far ahead of their time. So far ahead that nobody took them seriously. It's like they're real life time travelers or something. Like imagine what the world would be like if we had actually, you know, listened to these people. Well, they may have been ignored in their own day, but today they're going to get their due because we're going to talk about 10 scientists who were too far ahead of their time. Last year, the Nobel Prize in Physics went to three different physicists for their work on the Bell Inequality Theorem. Uh, I made a whole video about it. You can go check it out. But that Nobel Prize was a long time coming. The experiment that John Clauser won the prize for was first conducted in 1972. It took exactly 50 years for that work to be recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee anyway. And actually, that's not unusual. There's actually a name for it. It's called the Nobel Prize lag. Basically, it's where scientists win the prize years and sometimes decades after their discoveries. One study found that the average time between publishing work and receiving a Nobel Prize for it has almost doubled over the last 60 years. Chemistry has the longest lag at an average of 30 years over the past decade. Physiology or medicine has the shortest lag at 26 years. And it's getting longer. Uh, for the science prizes anyway. For example, after 1985, 15% of physics prizes were awarded within 10 years of the discoveries. Before 1940, the rate was 61%. Now there are several possible reasons for this. One of them is just that the sheer number of breakthroughs is increasing every year. Like our awards literally can't keep pace with all the people who deserve the recognition. Sounds like a good problem to have. But then there's the notion that, you know, some discoveries, some works just aren't appreciated during their time, that it takes another discovery or a mindset change for them to come into their own. And that, for the most part, anyway, is the case with the scientists that we're looking at in this episode. But one quick thing before I get into the rest of this video, one quick uh, caveat is that there's a potential interpretation that people could come away with this video having, and that's that maybe the point of the video is, hey, look at all the times science got it wrong. There's kind of this mindset that you see online quite a bit, and I think it's a dangerous one, frankly. And it's the idea that science is only moved forward by like maverick free thinkers, you know, who like push back against the science establishment. Ergo, if 99 scientists say that one thing is true and one scientist says that something else is true, then, you know, that's the guy you want to listen to. And yet, yeah, no, no, that's, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Look, scientists are human. Humans have blind spots and incentives and yeah, some are just bad scientists. And yeah, in some of the cases in this video, they just kind of accidentally stumbled on the right answer. Um, like there might have been hundreds of people working on this problem at the time, coming up with hundreds of different answers, and this one just happened to be right. And look, I get why the whole, you know, lone genius story is compelling. I used to be really into that. I used to think this way quite a bit more than I do now. You know, it's got a lot of like John Wayne swagger to it. You know, the, the genius with the world changing idea of being suppressed by the establishment, man. But the flip side of that is that, you know, convincing people that you're a genius with a world changing idea of being suppressed by the establishment is a, uh, it's a lucrative grift. Look, science is a slow, methodical march of experimenting, publishing, peer review, acceptance, and then expanding on that idea and starting the process all over again. It is with very few exceptions the work of some mad genius. But look, that slow, boring process is what we have to thank for, I mean, pretty much every aspect of the way we live our lives today. It works. So maybe the point of this video is that, you know, instead of chiding the scientific establishment for not getting it as early as maybe some of these people did, maybe we should cheer the fact that they were able to catch up and vindicate these guys. Guys like Ignaz Semmelweis. Ignaz Semmelweis was a Hungarian physician working in Austria when he noticed that one hospital had a very high death rate. I'm leaving a whole lot out of this, but long story short, he eventually proposed that maybe it could be lowered by having the surgeons wash their hands between working on patients. Yeah, at the time, physicians did not wash their hands between patients, and in fact, it was kind of like a badge of honor to be wearing very bloody clothes all the time, so there was like multiple people's blood on them. I'm glad I live when I do. But Ignaz uh, kind of stumbled on this idea that maybe you should be, you know, clean when you're, you know, tending to patients. But the other physicians disregarded his findings. They felt like they were insulted that he was calling them dirty. And he kept trying for years to convince doctors to clean themselves between patients. But yeah, he didn't, he didn't get anywhere, mainly because he actually couldn't prove why clean hands reduced death rates in hospitals. He just kind of like saw the numbers, but he couldn't figure out why it was happening. And he ended up dying in an insane asylum. 
It would take years after that for his theory to finally be accepted after Louis Pasteur, you know, confirmed the germ theory of disease. Now, obviously there's a lot more to this story um, and I could end it right there, but there are also some other things that add some nuance to the story, like the fact that apparently he was uh, kind of an asshole. Yeah, evidently one of the reasons why his ideas didn't make greater headway amongst other physicians and whatnot was because he kind of refused to perform experiments to prove his ideas. He was so convinced he was right that he kind of took issue with people asking him to prove it. And in lieu of that, he kind of just threw a bunch of ideas at the wall, like spaghetti, you know, and uh, he came up with all kinds of different explanations for it. One of them was Icarus exhalations. W whatever that is. So a lot of people have tried to kind of credit Ignaz Semmelweis as like the father of germ theory. He kind of predicted it more than, you know, actually started it. It was really Louis Pasteur later on who figured out the, the you know, there, there's microscopic organisms causing all this. But, you know, hey, credit where it's due. At least he wasn't covered in everybody's blood when he was working on patients. Today we all learn about Gregor Mendel in biology classes, basically the father of modern genetics, but... During his time, most people, most scientists, didn't understand Mendel's theories at all. And it's not like he wasn't doing his part to try to make them understand, it's just that replicating his experiments were harder than maybe he would like for them to have been. Like, sure, his experiments on pea plants were pretty easy, but reproducing those experiments on complex plants, or plants that are more complex than pea plants anyway, they just didn't always yield the same results. And yeah, it took almost two decades after Mendel died before his work was rediscovered and finally reproduced and understood. And on a personal note, that, that really surprised me. You know, like I said, we all learn about Gregor Mendel in school, and I just, he's, he's kind of considered somebody that changed everybody's thinking on genetics, and I just assumed that happened in his lifetime. But uh, no, he, he was a monk and a priest, and he just kind of died unknown, and his stuff was figured out later on. Ludwig Boltzmann is famous today as the guy who came up with the Boltzmann brain thought experiment and has the Boltzmann constant named after him. But in his own day, he wasn't very popular or appreciated at all in the scientific community. Yeah, Ludwig was a genius who uh, spent all of his time developing formulas and equations that explained the properties of atoms and then how those atoms affected, you know, physical nature of matter. The problem is many scientists didn't actually believe in atomic theory at the time. This was before that whole thing was accepted. So he was trying to prove that whole thing right with the math and he was successful at that. He got that right. but. Maybe for most of the scientists of the day, he was kind of putting the cart before the horse, as far as they were concerned. And it probably didn't help that he was apparently uh, severely bipolar, which may have limited him socially and whatnot. Uh, regardless, he kept fighting for it to be accepted, but sadly, he did eventually commit suicide. 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 Unalived. But anyway, just a few years later, his theory was accepted thanks to people like Albert Einstein and Max Planck. Ada Lovelace was born Augusta Ada Byron in 1815. Her father was the famous poet Lord Byron, who literally six months after she was born had a gathering in Geneva with Percy and Mary Shelley where famously the Frankenstein story was born. Weren't expecting a Frankenstein connection in this video, were you? So Ada obviously grew up wealthy and was seen to by the finest tutors and her thirst for knowledge was relentless. This interest in science and her family connections eventually led her to commiserate with intellectual heavyweights of the time like Michael Faraday and eventually the inventor Charles Babbage in 1833. He showed her some of his work and, and she took particular interest with a thing called the difference engine. This was an early analog calculator capable of automatically calculating large numbers. A Ada Lovelace was super interested in this thing and the two began corresponding with each other. So when Babbage was later working on a machine called the analytical engine, he asked Lovelace to translate a paper written about it. And she did, and while she was doing so, she added some notes to it, some uh, thoughts of her own, if you will. These thoughts are sometimes called the seven notes, which explained how a computer could work, even writing out programs for that computer. Yeah, it's said that she's actually the first person to really understand what a computer could be and how they could be useful for things other than just crunching numbers. But yeah, this was, you know, the early 1800s, and she was a woman, so she mostly just got a pat on the head and nobody really took her ideas seriously, but it wasn't until the 20th century that her contributions to Babbage's work and the, the literature that she left behind, you know, finally got it to do. And many people today consider her kind of the, the patron saint of computing. By the way, little side note, her name was never technically Ada Lovelace. She eventually married a guy named William King, whose position was the first Earl of Lovelace, so she became known as Ada Lovelace for English reasons. She also died at only 36 years old from cervical cancer, which kind of sucks. I mean, just, just think about what else she could have figured out in her life. 
William Harvey was a 50-year-old physician for several English monarchs during the turn of the 17th century. Needless to say, he was pretty well off. But in 1628, he uh, kind of challenged the medical community at the time, especially its belief about blood circulation. Harvey was actually the first doctor to observe the working hearts of living animals, which gave him an idea of how the blood was flowing from the ventricles to the atria and whatnot, and he published these findings in a book titled The Anatomical Study of the Motion of the Heart and of Blood in Animals in Germany. It took two decades for it to be translated into English, and when it did, <laughs> it did not go over well. At the time, the leading theory around blood circulation had actually been written by Galen, who was a Greek physician from the year 200 AD. So these ideas have been around for like 1400 years. And that idea was that the blood moved from one chamber of the heart to the other through sort of invisible holes, almost like there's a mesh in the heart that kind of moves the blood one way or another. Not to mention that most doctors at the time operated on the belief of the four humors and, and they practiced bloodletting as a way to bring the humors into balance. That was a big part of what they did as physicians. So this idea not only went against, you know, one and a half millennia of belief, but it also kind of made the other doctors jobs harder. So other physicians berated him and his ideas and his career suffered. And after spending a decade as the go-to doctor for kings and nobility, he actually eventually died a hermit. It would be hundreds of years before his views were finally recognized. So we all know about Pangaea, the most recent supercontinent from millions of years ago. Well, the reason you know about that is because of Alfred Wegener. In 1910, he noticed that the coastlines of Africa and South America looked like they could kind of fit together. They looked like sort of puzzle pieces, which really anybody who looks at a map would notice. And yet he obviously wasn't the first person to notice this. Many people had noticed it before, but the prior theory suggested that uh, Pangaea's landmass had sunk and filled in with water. And what was left behind were the seven continents we know today. But Wegener was the first to suggest that they had actually drifted apart on tectonic plates that slide around the world. And you can guess how well this went over in the beginning anyway. Other scientists called his theories delirious ravings and pseudoscience. Didn't seem to bother Wegener. He kept working on this theory until his death in 1930. So good news, he didn't go crazy. He wasn't, you know, pilloried and ostracized or anything. He kind of took it in stride and kept working on his theories throughout his life. But still, it took several decades before the scientific community accepted plate tectonics. Aristarchus of Samos lived in Greece in the 4th century BCE. During this time, people believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. They did not think it was flat, just that everything circled around us. But Aristarchus pushed back against this idea. He believed that the Earth went around the sun. And he also thought that the stars that we could see at night were from very, very far away. Uh, homeboy got it right way early on. Now, unlike some of the other scientists on the list, he wasn't harassed by his peers or put in jail or anything like that. Uh, but you could argue that what happened was much worse. He was ignored. You know, people at the time, they just, they just wanted to believe the Earth-centered theory because it just, it just aligned with their observations of the world. People did eventually come around to his theories, though, a good, you know, 1400 or so years later when Copernicus was able to put math behind the whole thing and it became an accepted theory. William B. Cowley was a 29-year-old doctor working at New York Memorial Hospital in 1891 when he noticed something unusual. He noticed that some of the cancer patients' disease would vanish after they contracted a specific and deadly streptococcus bacterial infection. So Coley did some research and he found out that 47 recorded cases of this had happened. He decided to conduct some human experiments around this. He found someone who had a terminal inoperable tumor and injected him with this bacteria. The patient, of course, got very ill after about five treatments or so, but his tumor did start to shrink. The tumor was gone two weeks later and the patient lived eight more years cancer-free. William Cowley basically discovered immunotherapy, which the medical community mostly dismissed during his life. But today immunotherapy is a huge part of cancer treatment. And uh, this has kind of restored his reputation. It took almost 200 years, but here we are. Long before Carl Benz built the first true modern automobile in 1886, there was Nicholas Joseph Cugnot. He was a French army officer and engineer, and he was tasked with building a steam-powered vehicle that could haul a cannon. So he worked on this, and he got a working model completed in 1769. And the next year, he unveiled a full-size version of the vehicle, calling it the Fardier de Vapeur. I'm sure I nailed that. Cugnot modeled his vehicle on an army horse cart, uh, but there was a third wheel instead of a horse at the front. And this third wheel supported a, a giant copper boiler and a link to drive the wheel. So it was a wood fuel steam powered car in 1796. It's insane. 
Now, before you go off and sell your Subaru, you should probably know it could only go about two miles an hour and it needed to be refueled with wood every 15 minutes. So, uh, also reports say that it was very difficult to maneuver. You think? So it was a good idea. Uh, didn't really find itself all that useful in practice, though, so the French army did abandon the vehicle after a few years. But Cugnot did receive a huge pension from King Louis XV for his invention, so uh, not too shabby. Zhang Heng is considered an inventor ahead of his time because he built an effective earthquake detector in 132 AD. Often called the Leonardo da Vinci of China, Zhang was an artist, astronomer, engineer, inventor, scholar, and scientist. And his invention that he called a seismoscope could identify seismic activity literally hundreds of kilometers away, determining exactly where an earthquake came from. It was basically a device that dropped a bronze ball from one of eight tube projections that were kind of shaped like dragon heads. The ball would then fall into the mouth of a corresponding metal object shaped like a toad. Because? Why? Who knows? But this represented the direction that the seismic wave was tr coming from. So whichever toad got the ball in its mouth, uh, you knew that was the direction that the earthquake came from. It was basically a device that was really sensitive that had these balls that would get shaken out of place by the inertia of an earthquake and from whatever direction it was coming from. There are no prototypes or documents or physical remains of this device, uh, but they're, they've been recreated in various ways, which is probably what you've seen on screen here. So yeah, very few people are as prescient and forward thinking as the examples in this video, but if you want to be a step ahead, you might want to check out today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a learning site and app that teaches you STEM skills in a fun, kind of gamified kind of way. I say gamified because it's kind of what it's like, you know? You just kind of solve problems and accidentally learn things like how LLMs work and data visualization, which are, by the way, two of their newest courses. They're adding new courses all the time. Like I've said this before, but I mean, think about how much time you spend just, you know, farting around on your phone, playing some mobile game. Well, imagine if when you're done with that game, you could do calculus or something. Because our brains are kind of hardwired to solve problems. That's why we see patterns everywhere, right? Well, that's the thing that's so great about Brilliant, is that it kind of hacks that natural problem-solving ability to teach really cool concepts. But the best part is that by learning it this way, it makes it easier to apply those lessons in your real life. It's a great way to learn stuff. I highly recommend it. And if you haven't tried it, you can try it for free for 30 days if you go to brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe. And if you decide to sign up for more, you can get 20% off the annual plan. Eh, just be one of the first 200 people to sign up. I'll put it in the link down below, but one more time with feeling, it's brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe. Go check it out. Thanks a lot for watching. If this is your first time here, here's a little link to a video that you might want to go check out. Google thinks you might like that one, or you can look at any of the others that YouTube might be showing you in the sidebar if you're on your browser or whatever. But yeah, go check them out. If you enjoy them and you're not subscribed, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. And I think that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.